In forested wilds beyond civilization, one special creature has long haunted humanity. The wolf has lurked in our imaginations as the very spirit of wilderness mystique and menace. In 1990, filmmaker Jim Dutcher set out to capture the first portrait of the hidden private life of a pack of wolves. He was joined by a fellow naturalist, and the two lived with a pack of untamed wolves for six years in the Sawtooth Mountains of Idaho. Jim and Jamie Dutcher had begun as friends. But the story of wolves also became a story of two people drawn together by a love for wildlife. The pack they studied grew far different from the demons of ancient myth. Rather, they were animals devoted to one another, capable of affection and bonds resembling those of human families. Through Dutcher's films, they gained fame as the Sawtooth Pack, ambassadors to a human world still fearful of wolves. Their story leads to both hope and heartache. Some wolves would survive, some would not. But the Sawtooth Pack gave us a new understanding of wolves. This is a story that may never happen again, of two people living with wolves. What they encountered was beyond their greatest expectations. of a wolf pack, these cold spring days are a time of celebration. A remarkable event has taken place. One among them, a female, has recently given birth in a secluded den in the forest. For the rest of the pack, excitement turns to play. adore puppies. They can barely wait to meet the new litter. The mother keeps her young hidden from all intruders, even her own pack. She will do anything to protect them. For filmmakers Jim and Jamie Dutcher, the moment has come for a test of the trust they've worked to gain during years spent living with this untamed pack of wolves. With the mother watching, Jamie will try to crawl down into the den, something perhaps never attempted before with animals long dreaded as ferocious predators. I really wanted to check on the health of the pups. I had spent a long time with the mother, but I couldn't be sure she wouldn't attack me. I tried to read her body language. It seemed to me that she had left the den so I could take a peek. I sure hoped I was right. of trust seems about to unfold between two species long regarded as mortal enemies. Puppies. Very nice. Yeah, you so cute. Look at you. You guys are tiny. It is the culmination of a project whose first seeds were sown not in Idaho, but in the mountains of Wyoming some 40 years earlier. The Absorka Mountains, just south of Yellowstone National Park. 
At the edge of this vast expanse of wilderness, young Jim Dutcher spent summers working as a wrangler on a ranch. Back then, I was a teenager with a dream summer job and a chance to play cowboy. My responsibilities were to take care of the horses. I would take them out in the evening and gather them up in the morning, driving them back to the ranch. For a boy from Florida, the back country of the ranch seemed a mountain paradise. With trout-filled lakes, forest roamed by grizzlies and moose, a place where wild encounters were possible. One day, while searching for stray horses, Jim came upon something he would never forget. In an opening ahead stood a gray wolf. It didn't seem threatening, just curious and unafraid. I didn't know enough about wolves to be aware of it at the time, but I'd actually seen something incredibly rare. As Jim began making films, the wolf in Wyoming remained a distant memory until another event changed his life. It was some 30 years later and I was looking for a new film idea when I saw another wolf, ironically at the same ranch. Like the earlier wolf, it posed no threat. It even seemed timid, leading Jim to wonder if wolves were really bloodthirsty killers. He imagined making a film about the true nature of wolves, only to learn that they are so wary of people, almost nothing of their private lives had ever been filmed, and they were disappearing. By 1990, only about 50 wild wolves were left in the entire American West. Two million had been exterminated to protect livestock, and the surviving wolves spent their lives in fear, avoiding humans. Even from the air, spotting wolves was nearly impossible. To film them closely, he needed a novel strategy. He had an idea, but it required just the right place. After almost a year of exploring, he found the perfect site on Forest Service land below Idaho's Sawtooth Mountains. He secured a special use permit, and the Wolf Project was born. He would set up the world's largest wolf enclosure, big enough to give a pack a sense of freedom. Next, Jim would try to assemble a wolf pack, beginning with a sedated adult male flown in from a wolf research center. They named him Akai, Blackfoot for wise one. If all went as planned, he would arrive to become leader of the new pack. Several wolf researchers gave Jim help and advice, but he knows there is no guarantee that a real pack will form. Nothing quite like this has ever been attempted. Carrying a Kai into wolf camp, they understand the significance. No wolf has lived here in 50 years. A Kai will be the first. Every event from now on will be documented to gain new insights into wolf behavior. The pack won't be as free as their wild cousins, but Jim hopes they might help shed light on a species whose daily lives remain almost completely hidden from us.
Akai is soon joined by an adult female Jim names Makui, Blackfoot for Wolf. Thus begins a project Jamie believes is unique among animal studies. What I've always loved about the way Jim put this project together was that his goal was to listen to the wolf, not as a scientist, but as a social partner. He learned early on that if he were to study the intimate life of an animal, he would have to live with that animal in order to gain its trust. Living in a tent for two years, Jim had earlier filmed the hidden life of a cougar, capturing unprecedented footage of its behavior. Always present, Jim was able to film a cougar mother caring for and teaching kittens and her rare vocalizations. <coughs> Filming next in a log cabin by an Idaho pond, he modified the technique, building within the cabin an authentic beaver lodge. The animals were free to come and go, while Jim was able to film the unseen world of beavers in the privacy of their lodge. Some questioned the wisdom of keeping log-chewing animals in a cabin made of logs, but the cabin survived, and today serves as the Dutcher's production studio. It now houses not wild animals, but their images. The world's largest close-up record of the gray wolf. In still photos, in miles of film, and in Jamie's sound recordings. The cabin also holds the record of the Dutcher's own personal story, one interwoven with their mutual attraction to the natural world. I first met Jim years ago on a flight from Africa. I had been in Zimbabwe taking pictures and although we didn't know it at the time, we both shared a love for wildlife. Like Jim, Jamie was drawn to nature as a child. Her equivalent of the wilds of Wyoming were the woods behind her Maryland home. She spent her spare time exploring and dreaming of living in some remote place with wild animals. After meeting Jim, Jamie returned to Washington, D.C., where she began a job at the National Zoo. There, surrounded by the exotic creatures she had always dreamed about, she would work toward a career caring for ailing animals in the zoo hospital. It wasn't the wilderness. It wasn't exploring. But it was a way to have constant contact with wildlife. But the man she had met on a flight from Africa began to write letters from Idaho. Jim shared his hopes and fears as he grappled with the challenges of filming the natural world. From afar, Jamie could only imagine what it must be like living in the wilderness. It was the beginning of a correspondence that would last for seven years. Friday, June 28th. Dear Jamie, it's early morning at Wolf Camp. The weather is clear and cold. In the low 30s last night, and the mountains behind camp look spectacular. Earlier, as we made a fire, a lone wolf was howling. Along with the two adults, my crew and I are also raising four wolf puppies. It's exhausting feeding them around the clock, but they're doing incredibly well. For Jim, it's a time of wonder and worry. Can he really assemble a wolf pack? What might the future hold as tiny pups leave the nursery and grow into one of the animal kingdom's most powerful forces, 
a pack of wolves. By 12 weeks, the pups at the Dutcher wolf camp display distinct personalities. One named Lakota is very shy, while his look-alike brother, Kamats, is the most alert and curious of the litter. It seems to Jim that little Kamats has the confidence and spirit of a natural leader. As the weeks pass, Jim notices that Kamats is becoming increasingly dominant, taking charge over a deer leg to drive away his siblings. Adult wolves generally welcome pups into a pack. No one expects a problem when it's time to introduce them to a Kai and Makui. But there's a surprise, one that reveals the true complexity of wolf behavior. The pups can barely contain their excitement. Jim hopes the two adults will pair up and become foster parents. But as the pups bound in, the adult female, Makui, slips away silently. Akai, the adult male, asserts himself and tries to impose some order. To impose some order. But Makui, to Jim's amazement and concern, wants no part of the pups. She disappears. Makui remains hidden somewhere in the woods. As days go by, Jim and his crew set out to find her, concerned she won't get enough to eat. She is so determined to stay hidden it takes three days to spot her. Jim can see she's okay for now, but he's baffled. Why is she avoiding the others? Makui remains absent for weeks while the new pack is developing a hierarchy. But here too, wolf behavior is proving extremely complicated. The drama unfolds whenever Jim delivers a roadkill carcass. Surprisingly, it is not the adult Akai who dominates, but young Kamats. The stability of a wolf pack depends on a single leader called the alpha male. Jim begins to realize that it's not a matter of age or size, but something innate that drives one wolf to take command of all the others. None of the wolves, not even Akai, is challenging young Kamats as he asserts himself like an alpha. When Makui finally comes out of hiding, she seems too afraid to join. Jim grows increasingly worried about her behavior. The Rocky Mountain winter settles in, burying Wolf Camp under a thick blanket of snow. Somewhere beyond, Makui remains alone. To mirror normal wolf feeding patterns, Jim and his crew bring in carcasses of deer, elk, or antelope every five days or so. Wolf pups must grow quickly to survive their first hard winter in deep snow. The sawtooth young are now almost adult size. Food, 
prompts excitement. But Kamatz presides. No one eats without his permission. From afar, Makui watches. She appears hungry, as if she wants to join in on the meal and the play. But she doesn't. Increasingly worried about Makui, Jim frequently takes elk meat to her. Their meetings are too brief for Jim, who hopes to gain her trust and to discover why she has become a loner. The notion of a lone wolf is largely legend. A wolf normally remains solitary only for a short time. Jim spends the winter trying to befriend Makui, hoping to figure out why her behavior is so unusual. A wolf's every impulse tells it to be part of something larger, to belong to a pack. Its identity is completely intertwined with that of its family. With each visit, Jim is more convinced that Makui yearns for companionship. Gradually, she allowed me closer, as if enjoying the company of another being. It was heartbreaking to think that I was her only friend. But at close range, Jim can see the problem at last. Her eyes are completely clouded over. Is she fearful of the new pack because she can't see them well? And does she feel safer following trails up here that she has probably memorized? Jim knows there is something wrong with Makui's eyes. He needs the help of an expert, but doesn't know one. He finally realizes he knows exactly the right person to contact. While Jim worries about an ailing wolf in Idaho, Jamie is consumed with her work at the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. His pulse is strong. She has no idea that the medical knowledge she is gaining will have an impact beyond the zoo. Temperature looks good. She is about to hear again from the wolfman in the west. Jim needs advice from someone with veterinary experience. Concerned about the wolves, Jim also just needs to talk to a friend. Dear Jamie, I know it's been a long time, but I've got a serious problem here with an adult female wolf. I'm in the yurt and she's howling so sadly outside. She seems to be a loner. I've been trying, I've been trying to get, to get close, close to her, to, her to, see to see what might be the problem. I'm convinced there's something wrong with her eyes. It may be cataracts. Have you any ideas? I could really use some help. It was obvious from this letter how much Jim cared about these animals. I suggested that he contact a veterinary ophthalmologist to examine her eyes. I knew that they had performed cataract surgery on domestic dogs. I just wish I could have been there to help him. Taking Jamie's advice, Jim finds a top animal eye surgeon and outfits Wolf Camp with veterinary surgical equipment. He fears that carting Makui off to a hospital could deeply stress an animal already full of anxiety. He turns the tent into a field hospital. It's okay, Makui. 
It's going to be okay. But, okay, now I'll get your, your jack feed injection over here. It's right here. There's an impartial resort. That's why. Watching the surgery, Jim reflects. Filming the natural world, it is impossible to know what direction the story will take, especially when the subject is an animal we know so little about. The result is another surprise. Makui emerges with her eyesight restored. But she never fully trusts Jim in the same way. Neither of the two adult wolves have grown comfortable or accepted Jim. Reluctantly, he decides to concentrate on the yearlings and to find another home for Makui and Akai. It won't be easy giving them up, but it's for the best. Kamats and the other yearlings knew me from the moment they opened their eyes. Their trust was absolute and understood. I knew deep in my heart that the future of the Sawtooth Pack rested with them. A dark female named Mataki catches Jin's eye. In the emerging hierarchy of the yearlings, Mataki has been relegated to the role of Omega, lowest ranking member of the family. At the bottom of the pecking order, Mataki is part scapegoat for the pack's aggression, and part clown, forever diffusing tension by initiating play. The Omega is an important member of the pack, not an outcast, but it's always on the bottom. <laughs> Though Mataki's role as a jester is appreciated by the wolves, her low rank is made clear at every meal. Kamats and the others eat first. Mataki must always eat last. Sometimes, as if to avoid trouble, Mataki wanders off alone. She is less than a year old and not very savvy about dangers lurking beyond the protection of the pack. When Mataki fails to show up one day, Jim goes looking for her. What he finds is his worst nightmare. The gentlest, most playful member of the pack was dead. Who or what had done this? For a moment I feared the killer might still be nearby watching me. I tried to think. Maybe a cougar was responsible. Some of Mataki's fur had been removed, something I had observed while filming a cougar and its kill. I found wolf claw marks and a telltale sign, some of Mataki's fur. I think the pack found her killer in this tree and tried to claw their way up to get the cougar that had killed their sister. The death of Mataki 
has a profound effect. The rest of the wolves seem listless, mired in a deep depression through spring and into the summer. Their howling takes on a mournful, searching quality, as if they are trying to call Mataki back. Mataki's death really affected Jim deeply. Her loss and the mournful state of the pack was devastating. After losing sweet-natured Mataki, Jim wonders how he can raise the pack's spirit. There is one perfect way. Jim decides to expand the pack and enliven it with three new pups. <laughs> The young wolves went beyond just accepting me. They bonded with me, and as detached and scientific as I tried to be, I bonded with them. Here, have the bottle. Have the bottle. Who knows it's not bottle. Wolf camp is serenaded by new voices. As Jim begins to chronicle their emerging personalities, one spirited beige male catches his eye. Unaware the pup will grow up to be the pack peacemaker and his favorite. He names him Matsi, Blackfoot for sweet and brave. At 16 weeks, the pups join the others. Instinctively, they recognize the dominance of the adults and drop down submissively in their presence. Kamats leads them on a tour of their new home. can see a new hierarchy developing. The rankings are sorted out over food. Kamats presides, but at times he just observes, as if curious about the power struggles taking place. The young wolf Jim calls Matsi seems bolder than the other pups. He even drives away Lakota, the brother of Kamats. Despite Lakota's imploring looks, Kamats never intervenes. As the second autumn passes, Jim wonders if the yearlings will form the stable pack he had hoped for with Akai and Makui. One day, Kamats approached me, but instead of trotting off as he usually did after greeting me, he sat down next to me. In a gesture I'd never seen before, he raised his paw. I held my hand out to meet it, and we just sat there. At that moment, I knew everything was going to be all right. I realized that the one who would stabilize the pack and make the whole project work wasn't me, it was Kamats. Another winter descends, imposing bitter cold. The deep snow is an obstacle to filmmakers but a big white playground to wolves wearing thick new coats. Though Kamats the Alpha appears to play aggressively, when he inadvertently knocks a yearling over, he returns as if to apologize. 
To Jim, it seems that the confidence Kamats possessed in youth is blossoming into a calm benevolence. He is more alert than the others, with a look that seems to convey the intelligence and concern of a leader. Dear Jamie, at last things are beginning to look a little bit more positive. We just had our first snowstorm and the pack loved it. More importantly, I'm starting to see some new behavior. I wish you could see how Kamaz takes care of his pack. I suppose we all have moments in our lives that are milestones. I was stopped by Jim in the aisle of an airplane, a brief and pleasant meeting that turned my life upside down seven years later. Jim's letters to Jamie had continued since their brief meeting. Letters about wolves and snowstorms, wild puppies and minus 40 degree temperatures. They had interests in common, but a continent between them. Then, a letter changes Jamie's life. Jim asks her to come meet the wolves and see if she might like living in Idaho. say I was being asked to go live in an ice-cold tent on the other side of the continent it was crazy but by then I knew I loved Jim so I went in her early 30s Jamie leaves behind her Maryland home and her career gambling that life among wolves in Idaho will be more like the life she dreamed of as a child. A life of wild animals and adventure. As she's about to find out, she has no idea how adventurous it will be. Yesterday, home for Jamie was a suburban house outside Washington, D.C. Now, it is a tent, surrounded by snow, without electricity, water, or plumbing. It's called a yurt, a round tent traditionally used by Mongolian nomads to endure hard winters. It's about 16 feet in diameter, with a conical roof that withstands the weight of deep snow. One room, few comforts, middle of nowhere. But the backyard is glorious. For Jamie, it feels like her dream is coming true. Idaho was hardly the far off and desolate land it had once seemed. I have to smile to myself thinking back on how foreign and scary it had been in my mind. It immediately felt like home. A beautiful home. As Jim took me to meet the wolves, I sensed that I was regaining something I once felt as a child in the natural world. It had begun to fade from my life, and so had the dream of living with wild animals. Now it was coming... Always keeping an eye on the young, Matsi is their caretaker and educator. But there is little Matsi can do about Shemok. She will have to find her own way in the pack. I wanted to be an impartial observer, but Lakota the Omega touched my heart. Always trying to please his brother the Alpha, hunched over, tail tucked in submission. I began spending a lot of time documenting Lakota. 
I noticed that although the pack always picked on him, they clearly cared about him, especially Motsi, who would stand by making sure Lakota was okay. I realized there's a lot going on in the inner lives of wolves. I kept trying to film Jamie and Lakota together. But every time I would turn the camera on, Lakota would become nervous and move away. Jim experiments in an effort to make Lakota more comfortable. He replaces the movie camera with a smaller still camera and sets up further away, hoping to capture the growing bond between the Omega and Jamie. Lakota took a big risk spending time with me. If the pack had caught him getting special attention, they would have attacked him. But sometimes we would just sit together. Once he took his paw and he gently placed it on my shoulder and gazed at me with those wise amber eyes of his. We sat that way for quite a while. From that moment, I was captivated by him, and I knew he would forever hold a special place in my heart. With the Dutchers' move into the wolves' territory, the human and wolf worlds merge. Because Jim and Jamie are living with the pack, they witness behavior they couldn't have seen otherwise. For example, the comedy routine that takes place with food between Wyakin and her brother Wahats. Thinking no one is looking, greedy young Wyakin sneaks away with meat. Unaware, Wahats is watching. She quietly hides her secret stash in the bushes. Wahats tails her silently, perhaps suspicious of her bulging belly. But Wahats figures out that if he waits, his sister will do all the work. As soon as Wyakin leaves, Wahats dashes in and eats the hidden meat. From then on, Wyakin is always bewildered when she can't find her stash, unaware that her brother is outwitting her. Some winters are cold, but some are brutal. The Dutchers are consumed by daily chores and by life with the wolves. Half a decade will pass as a blur of seasons. Winter cold seems to melt suddenly into summer heat. Summer is quickly winter again. But there is music accompanying the passage of time, an ancient music of the wild. Sound recorders for the films, Jamie spends her spare time accumulating an archive of the pack's howls. finds that she can identify individual wolves by their unique inflections. Surprisingly, Lakota had the most beautiful howl. Eyes shut and head thrown back, he would just pour his heart out, rich, mournful, lonely and sad. I felt as if I were listening to him sing the blues, giving voice to the despair of an Omega. Jamie believes that wolves are so intelligent that they can communicate in complicated ways through their howls and body postures. 
ways we don't yet understand. Each was an individual in personality and voice, but needed to feel forever linked with his companions in the pack. They constantly rubbed and licked one another as if to reassure themselves of this closeness. Even competitive wrestling was a way of reinforcing that each had a place in the pack structure, that they were a united family. It is at last clear to Jim and Jamie that the project is succeeding. The pack is now a cohesive family. Most importantly, the wolves trust their human friends. We had names for each, but they didn't know that. We didn't approach the pack. The wolves came to us only if they chose to. It made their friendship all the more rewarding. Kamatz was in charge, but he could be just as playful as the others. I'd come to admire him immensely after years of watching him lead. To be accepted by him, to be worthy of his attention, and maybe even affection, was an overwhelming honor. Early on, the Dutchers learned that the wolves rarely sleep through the night. To capture the full range of pack vocalizations, Jamie sets up an outside microphone wired to sound gear in her bed. Even when howling breaks out in the middle of the night, she's ready to record. Wolves howl at any time, day or night, sometimes in response to a distant sound, sometimes to check on one another. Jamie believes wolves howl for more reasons than we can know. Often the whole pack rallies together and starts a game of tag, playing in the dark, unmindful the bone-chilling cold. Their nightly singing became as soothing as rainfall on a window, an ancient sound of the earth, of life itself. The singing would end, and the pack would settle down, leaving the world silent again. I would fall asleep, wanting this magical life to go on forever. Winters in the mountains of Idaho are marathons of endurance for Jim and Jamie Dutcher. The valley surrounding Wolf Camp, chilled by high altitude and sweeping winds, is one of the coldest spots in the United States. To get warm, the Dutchers must occasionally go indoors. 
But so little body heat escapes a wolf's thick coat that snow does not even melt on its fur. They can lie completely exposed to the fury of winter. No matter how severe the weather becomes, Jim and Jamie are always amazed to find the pack completely unaffected. Sometimes the wolves curl up and sleep through the worst storms. They never seek shelter in a den or under trees. They seem a perfect animal for winter. Not only are they blasé about the cold, they greet fresh snow as if it's a gift from heaven, some new surprise that always puts them in a mood to play. Two of the most fun-loving are the young female Wayakin and her black sister Shamuk, once shy but increasingly rambunctious and assertive. The Dutchers believe that Kamats will soon pick one to be his mate, to become the alpha female and the mother of the pack's first litter. Jim and Jamie still feel Shamuk might become an Omega, like poor Lakota, but they know better than to predict wolf behavior. In fact, the caretaker Matsi has begun to discipline Shamuk's siblings, enabling Shamuk to begin moving up in rank. So far, Kamats seems more interested in snow than in choosing a mate. Usually, only two in a wolf pack will mate the alpha male and female. Yet all sense that something important is about to happen. There's an electricity in the air. It may be the dead of winter but the heat of the mating season approaches. As January turns to February, Jamie notices a distinct change in Shamuk. She grows even more assertive and less timid. Everyone is on edge. Only the alphas mate, but all of the wolves experience the urge to reproduce. The pack remains friendly to them, but Jim and Jamie sense the mood turning more serious, as if the wolves know a turning point is coming. Will Kamats choose the watchful Shamuk, or the female the Dutchers believe better suited, Wyakin, who is larger and livelier? One day it is obvious to Jamie, from the intensity of the pack and their vocalizations, that the females have gone into heat. The situation is not lost on Kamats. Suddenly, Kamats makes his choice clear. It is little Shamuk, to the Dutcher's surprise, and perhaps to hers as well. From that moment on, Shamuk's life and that of the entire pack changes dramatically. The shy female expected to become an Omega has risen instead to the role of alpha female the mate of the leader. Since wolves usually pair for life, Shamuk will reign supreme over the other females in the pack, effectively becoming the queen mother of the family. If her story had unfolded in the fairy tale world, 
Little Shamuk would be Cinderella. Wyakin had seemed the likely princess. Now she could only watch. And so the wait begins to see if the tender rituals of courtship will lead to the first pups produced by the sawtooth pack itself. In the third week of April, in approaching. More like their natural world. Hmm. None of them will come to us if we ask them to. Hmm. Yeah. Everything's on their terms. Yeah. And he's just sort of investigating you. And this is the Omega? Yeah, and he's at the bottom of the pack, where Kamatz is the leader. Hmm. Even though we have names for these wolves, they don't respond to their names. Mm. They, I don't think they even know their names. But it keeps them straight. For Impressed us. by the tribe's involvement in efforts to bring wild wolves back, Jim believes the Nez Perce would provide a safe future for the pack. In late summer, a potential tragedy intensifies Jim and Jamie's concern for the welfare of the pack. A major forest fire in the Sawtooths crosses a ridge above them and for a time seems headed for wolf camp. All the Dutchers can do is watch and hope. Fortunately, the fire is controlled. But the engulfing smoke and the approaching deadline on the land permit prompt a decision. It is time to find a permanent and safe home for the Sawtooth Pack. The Nez Perce offer to give the pack a home on their tribal lands when the permit expires. For Jim and Jamie, the news is bittersweet. The wolves will have a lasting home, but after six years of living with them, of knowing them as friends, it won't be easy to say goodbye. We filled those final summer days just spending as much time with the wolves as possible hardly even filming. We wanted to memorize every move they made, every facial expression, to imprint them forever in our minds. On August 6, 1996, we set out for northern Idaho, carrying the pack to their new home on Nesper's land. It was the saddest trip that I had ever taken. At its end, we would be leaving not only the wolves, but also the life that Jamie and I and the wolves had created together. High Eagle welcomes the pack to the tribal lands of the Nez Perce. It's time to see their new home for the first time. Jim and Jamie decide to let the youngest members of the pack out first, so the adults would be comforted knowing the pups were free and safe. The first adult out is Kamatz, followed in turn by the rest of the pack. But the Dutchers know that the others will attack the Omega if he were to emerge ahead of them. So Lakota must wait to be let out last. A moment occurs with Kamatz 
that symbolizes the Alpha's devotion to his pack and the solidarity of a wolf family. Kamats returns to the crate holding Lakota, gently coaxing his fearful brother to come out. Kamats knew that Lakota would need some encouragement and he refused to lead the wolves into this new territory until his pack was complete. Kamats wouldn't leave his brother behind, Omega or not. The pack explores with exuberance, but caution. Until certain there are no other wolves or predators, they remain silent, sniffing every inch of the terrain and listening to every new sound. After several hours, one by one, they return to the Dutchers, almost as if sensing that the time had come for a farewell. The first was Lakota who licked us. I'm gonna miss you guys. I wondered if he would ever escape the role of Omega. I hoped he would. Then Kamats, the steadfast leader, who made our wolf project succeed and won my heartfelt respect. Be together, but I will never forget you. And Matsi, who touched me deeply, the pack's caretaker and peacemaker. I didn't miss you, Matsi. The one who looked after the young and often defended poor Lakota. You're going to be all right in this new place. They had been our life and our close companions. But in the end, they were a wolf pack. They had their own family, a good family. Would they remember us? Would they adapt to this unfamiliar place? In wooded back country of northern Idaho, on tribal lands of the Nez Perce, Seasons pass for a wolf pack, unaccompanied for the first time by Jim and Jamie Dutcher. But the tribe sends news. All are well, and there has been a big shift in the hierarchy. With the help of Matsi the Peacemaker, Lakota has finally escaped the role of Omega, replaced by another adult. From afar, the Dutchers can only imagine Lakota's relief. To give the pack ample time to grow accustomed to life on their own, Jim and Jamie stay away. But after nearly a year, the urge to see them and to check on their well-being can no longer be resisted. But how will the wolves now feel about them? We were very nervous how the pack might react to us. We were afraid they might think of us as strangers. Their fears dissolve in a marathon of liquor. Oh, 
my God. It was wonderful to see them again. Even after all this time, the wolves still welcomed us. That precious sense of trust between us was still there. And so was their affection. I couldn't voice my feelings, but they could. The Dutchers have long hoped for the return of wild wolves. Conviction deepened by the years spent with the Sawtooth Pack. East of their Idaho home, they trek deep into Yellowstone National Park. In an attempt to restore a native predator here, 30 wolves were reintroduced to the park in the mid-1990s. Their numbers have grown to more than 200, and researchers are finding their presence beneficial to the ecology of the park. Our hope is that the fear of wolves is fading, that people are beginning to know them as caring animals devoted to their families, animals that deserve a chance to survive. We believe the wolves of the Sawtooth Pack were the forerunners of their wild cousins, opening people's eyes, serving as ambassadors from their kind to ours. Wolves live only about seven to ten years. Wolves live only about seven to ten years. In time, members of the Sawtooth Pack begin to disappear. When word reached me that Kamatz had died, I was devastated. I don't believe I'll ever forget that moment. He was such a friend. For three weeks after his death, a single wolf was heard howling in the night. I wonder if it was his brother, Lakota. As time passed, we lost more of the pack. Lakota, my dear friend Matsi, and we knew we would have to say farewell to all of them. We hope they made a difference, that their story helped their kind. On an autumn day, Jim and Jamie set out on a mission of the heart, one they have long avoided. They head down the trail to the old site of Wolf Camp. There is no trace left of the camp. The trails are overgrown where the wolves once ran. The hardest thing is returning to wolf camp. And for the longest time, we couldn't even do it. As they near the old site of the yurt, Jamie, a remarkable look. surprise. Look here. Look at Jim this. finds a wolf track. The sawtooth pack has been gone for years. The track has to be that of a wild wolf passing through here in the past few days. By the size of the print, a large male. It means that wild wolves are back in the wilderness of Idaho for the first time in 50 years. For Jim and Jamie, this roaming wolf provides a poignant close to the story of the sawtooth pack. They know that wolves often travel great distances following the scent of other wolves. This one had probably dispersed from a reintroduced pack up north and was traveling south to find a mate and start a new family. I wonder how the wolf responded when he picked up the fading traces of the sawtooth pack. 
Did he look around in silence, wary of encroaching on their territory? Or did he howl in hopes of joining them? Perhaps he felt more comfortable, assured by the scent of distant kin, that this was wolf country. I like to think that was the case. That here, where we once lived with wolves, he felt like he belonged.